Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the holiday astronomy podcast where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the topics are unpredictable. <laughs> That's, That's true. true. <laughs> we are Strange Charm and Top the Astrocorks, also known as Josh Cole, Addy Dove, and Jim Cooney, coming to you from the Walkabout Studios at the University of Central Florida. Be sure to stick around at the end of the episode to see us instantly become less interesting. <laughs> Our stumpers are televisional. Okay. All right. All right. I'll take that. You'll take really? it? Really? Yeah. All right. Here we go. For Jim, for all mankind, and by that I mean not the classic documentary of Apollo footage of the moon landings, but the new Apple TV Plus oh, yeah. series. That you've definitely seen. <laughs> or The Man in the High Castle. So I'll be clear. I haven't seen either one of these. Oh, 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 well, that's not entirely true. I saw the first couple episodes of Man in the High Castle. Which is an alternate history show. So I, I gather they're both alternate history they're shows, both right? Oh, history. you found the connection. I found the connection. Uh, I haven't seen either one. Don't let that stop you. I'm not going to let that stop me. I never let that stop me. Never I don't have let very strong be very held opinions on excellent. anything, independent of whether I have any knowledge or not. Um, I'm going to go with Man in the High Castle. Even though, so, so well... So the man in the high castle is the uh, Nazis. It's like if the World Nazis, yeah, if the if the if the Axis, if the Axis had yeah. won World War Two, mm -hmm. but then America's there's also some weird things like they, the, I guess they like the people in that timeline occasionally find video that suggests that's that the from, Allies had won, and and it's weird, and I don't really know what the end result it, of Andy? all this I is. I only watched. I watched the first season and part of the second season, and then for some reason we stopped, and I yeah. haven't watched the rest. But I keep seeing previews for the final season, and it's totally spoiling some things. Oh, uh, no. But I think I will go back and watch it. But uh, the reason it. I'm going to vote yeah. for that one is because it was based on a story by Philip, Philip K. K. Dick. And I have not yet seen – or I've never read anything by Philip K. Dick that I didn't what? like, and I haven't oh. seen anything <laughs> – <laughs> Uh, uh, and I haven't seen any of his uh, the things that have been adapted that I haven't liked. So right. So uh, some of the other. So Blade Runner is the most Blade famous. Blade Runner is very famous, uh, but, but which is based on his book called "Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep?" Right. Uh, which is it, I've read it, and it's really quite different than the movie Blade Runner. It is. It is. But the the, the kind of the fundamental themes are the same, right? I mean, or at least in some sense, yeah, yeah. like what you know, oh, yeah. what is what does it mean? What does it mean to be? Yeah, mm -hmm. to be conscious or a human or whatever. Yeah. So, uh, whatever. I like Philip K. Dick, and I haven't read Man in the High Castle, and I haven't seen the show, but I'm voting for it. Even though I do think the one positive for the other one is, I think it's what is it, Ronald D. Moore or whatever. This, yes, uh, Ronald D. Moore created it. He he he's was the Battlestar the Galactica guy, Battle which Galactica which I loved. Did. Except the, the reason I'm not voting for it is we now hate him, not him, but because they didn't have a plan. Oh, the Battlestar Galactica, like, they didn't have a plan. They didn't have a plan. I have a grudge about that. Yeah, we But he was great. also uh, one of the creative forces behind Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Right, yeah. which was great. Which was great. Which was great. Uh, the For All Mankind is if, the, I guess, if the Soviets, if the Soviets had won, won the, the right. race to the moon. Right, they get to the moon first, and then we keep it's going a, with the, the space yeah, race instead of ending it. I was watching the previews for it, and it was, was I did like, see that part. It was all about... I don't know. It was obviously an alternate history. Anyway, Addy, his dark materials or the dark crystal age of resistance. Uh, this is a tough one. <laughs> have you seen uh, either one of those? I have seen them both. Oh, yeah. oh really? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We watched all of Dark Crystal and we've been watching uh, the new His Dark Materials. Yeah. Okay. Um, they're both really good. Uh, I actually like love both of them. His so, Dark Materials is based on a series the of Golden books. Golden Compass series of right. books, which there was a movie, The Golden Compass, a while back that like apparently didn't do very well because it yes. wasn't as dark as it as the actual story what is. What are his dark materials? I don't know. Yes. I thought you've seen them. Like, There's only been like, like three episodes. Like nylon oh, you still don't know rayon? what his dark materials are? I don't think right. so. <laughs> is that what we're talking about? <laughs> no. I think it has something to do with dust though. Oh. So there's this whole thing with dust in the show, which I love okay. because I love dust. All right. Um so I think I'm going to pick that one, and but the, but the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance is the Dark Crystal. Um, that was like a 1980s movie, Jim, right? Jim, Jim Henson. Henson. Yeah, and yeah, so like it's Muppet, still yeah. with Jim Henson and M Muppets. Muppet sci-fi <laughs> yeah, movie. Yeah, and so the new one uses them too, and there's like a little tiny bit of CG, but mostly it's Muppets, so it's super cool that That's they awesome. like... That's fun. And it, it's it's different watching that these days, but it's still like a good story, and it's yeah. well, it's pretty well done. It blows my mind how many of these kinds of shows and movies there are now that a lot of them I've like never even heard of. When yeah. I was a kid, it was just like, okay, I just hope that there's a rerun of Lost in Space <laughs> on because that happens in space. So there yeah. will be something 
Science fiction-y, oh shoot, yeah. there isn't. So that's it. That's all you, you know, get. Or, you know, <laughs> just... What routinely it, it surprises me about all these, they all are like, a lot of them are really good and have good production. It's not like these are, yeah. I mean, there are a billion channels out there and there's a lot of crappy stuff on a lot of those channels, but like there's so many good things that I like, I hadn't heard of and all of a sudden I hear of it and it's like this awesome show that right. uh, is. Yeah. Well, one of the things that has transformed things is I think partly expansion of the economy, people spend more money on entertainment. So mm-hmm. we're paying channels like Netflix, Amazon Prime, HBO, et cetera. So they have money to produce things. But the other big change, I think, is just the ability to do CGI graphics. Right. Star Trek, with all of its cheesy original Star Trek, with all of its, you know, 1960s era sci-fi effects, special effects, was a very expensive show to make. It's one of the reasons why it only lasted three seasons. Yeah. Is because it was expensive because all the effects were practical and they didn't really have. Now it's just like a computer program. So right. I don't want to minimize the effort that goes into doing all that stuff, but it it's cheaper. Right. Obviously, or they wouldn't be doing it that way. Uh, today we're talking about geysers on Europa. We'll take a look at swirls on the moon and chunky space time, which is a new candy bar. <laughs> <laughs> Chunky yeah, space know. time. Yeah, new and flavor the Milky Way line. Soup. Yes, in the Milky Way Oh, yeah, line. it could be a Campbell soup. Yeah. But first, this episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by the Era of Recombination. Ooh. Cast your mind back to a simpler time when electrons were electrons and protons were protons and each knew their place in the universe, the hydrogen atom. That paragon of atomic simplicity is what ultimately made you possible. Starting at a redshift of 1100, or if you're more colloquially inclined... 380,000 years after the Big Bang, give or take, the era of recombination marked the end of that hot, dense state and the beginning of a new transparent era in the universe when photons were finally free to travel wherever their space timelines took them. And now, thanks to the era of recombination, you too can enjoy a walk about the galaxy. Yay. The era of recombination, the pause that refreshes. <laughs> um. That was, a, that was awesome, by the way. That was, was uh, throwback. I, to, to uh, my heart, that was beautiful. It was, it <laughs> cosmologically related. Uh, it was. Uh, was so we appreciate that era of recombination. I like the fun fact follow is, your own space timeline. Yes. I like that. That was fun. Fun fact is that it, it's a, kind of a bad name. It's right? a terrible name, right? Because this was the first time in the universe where it was combined. <laughs> electrons and protons combined to make uh, neutral hydrogen. How did it get the name recombination? I don't know. This was an old thing. It had, it had to do with just it, chemistry. Like uh, oh. in chemistry, when electrons and protons come together, they call it recombination oh, because they've yeah. been they, together before. Because usually, yeah. Um, because it's hard to get them apart. Right. But, but there for, had to be a first time. Right. This was the, this first, was time. the first time. <laughs> it should so, be called yeah. the era, the era of, of combination. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we bungled. That'd be so. But Oops. astronomers are notoriously, maybe everybody's like this, but it seems like we hang on to these historically terrible right. names and right. definitions. Like, yeah. We've talked about the spectral types where they put these letters yeah. and then at some point meant something, but now it's just this random O B A F G K M in some yep. random and then like the type uh population one and population two stars is my other favorite because right. they're they in backwards to, order. Yeah. And then yeah. They, they have, have to have population, population zero. zero. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I hate the magnitude system. That's a ridiculous magnitude. thing. It's oh, yeah. based they're on something. That, yeah. How bright something is, the, the smaller the number, the brighter yeah. it is. It's crazy. We do, yeah, we do. We, we could change these things. But we could. <laughs> no. We could just Not call possible. it the era of combination. <laughs> yeah. But no. All right. It's the era of recombination. Yep. Uh, the pause that refreshes. The pause. Jeez, I don't know. Pause. P-A-U-S-E. Yeah. That refreshes. Pepsi-Cola. Um, Diet Coke. Coca Cola. Oh, oh we're so close. 1927. Oh, oh wow, that's, yeah. that's a long time ago. Going Almost as far back as recombination. The, the yeah. This is back in the days of cocaine in the. In the uh, uh, not quite. Not that quite far, original I think. recipe. Not quite original recipe. Mm. Um, what did they have? Reach out. Make the. I don't, what were the, some? I'm I'm trying to think of some of the 70s Coke things, but whatever. Um, space news. Uh, Starship had a little mishap. Well, it had a. A bigger mishap. A pretty big mishap, I guess. They were doing a cold. They were doing test. like a, a they test were pumping to it filled see with... how how much they could pressurize something. Oh, and it turns out and they found out how they much found they the could. limit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not really a mishap. It's kind of a, a semi-intentional mishap. I don't think they were. They weren't really trying to blow to it up, failure, but they weren't. But they weren't shocked, shocked that it did. That it yeah, happened, oh, I see. I think. For, well, I mean, so that's from like Sometimes some PR maybe said that. Right, but. right. 
sometimes there are tests where you say, okay, we're going to push it until it breaks. Yeah, yeah. I and saw you have that, to do that to know where, when that happens. Right. I saw that um, ages ago, a video when they were testing airplane wings, like Boeing oh, 7, yeah. 777 right. wings, and they had them. Those things just bend like, a push, lot they were before they break. They were vertical at the tip really? and they, before they snapped. That yeah, makes me feel yeah. a lot better because sometimes, I often get a, wing, a wingish seat. And and you see out there, the wings are flat. flat <laughs> so you're like, you're they, like, they have to break off. They're <laughs> definitely going to break off. No. <laughs> they never do. Um, Starliner has been moved into place for an upcoming test flight. Yeah. That is the, the Boeing, Boeing commercial crew capsule. Uh, how about that crazy Tesla truck? The Cybertruck? The Cybertruck was unveiled this week. It's like some sort of Tron, it, Blade Runner. Have you seen this, Jim? I, I saw Triangle headlines, but I didn't truck. actually read it. Okay. I, imagine I, I a don't truck, have enough money to and buy it. Yeah. This looks nothing like imagine that. Imagine a truck. <laughs> and then look at like what this thing is. It's triangles and lines and things. It's, it's just very that strange. looks like Blade Runner or something, yeah. It's what like a cyberpunk it. thing, right? Even like the way they wrote it on the screen right. is very cyberpunk, but it's like maybe that's not going to do so well in the mainstream market. I'll be very curious to see them cruising down the highway. It, I mean, it was a prototype, right? Because it could yeah. they could smooth it out. I imagine it may not look exactly. But like I also that. wasn't clear. Most of the views I saw, it didn't actually look like a truck. Like like. Oh, where's the truck part of it? Actually, there's not a lot of truck bed. Yeah. it seems like. Yeah. yeah, it looks like They a always car. show it like from the front. Right. And it's very difficult to see. I guess the truck bed is probably just covered yeah. in the, most of the models, but. Hey. Hey. Big, big news in the publishing world. Oh. A new hot book, off the presses? Hot off the presses. The Ringed Planet, second edition. Ooh. Ooh. Published today. <laughs> published today. Yes. New and improved and Cassinier. <laughs> now with more Cassini. Now with more Cassini, yes. Aww. Just like uh, Saturn. Uh, second uh, ringed ringed planet Cassini's voyage of discovery at Saturn second edition with results from the grand finale Ooh. is out and available in paperback hardback and ebook editions awesome uh, by yours truly and uh, published by Morgan and Claypool they have a whole series of uh, um, books Short. that they publish with the Institute of Physics Short treatises yes uh, this one is equation free. Aimed Ooh. at the interested uh, member of the general public. Perhaps the walkabout listeners. Perhaps a walkabout hey, listener. Sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, could if we have a could if, we have a giveaway oh, of a book to a walkabout that's listener? Probably a good idea. Yeah. We could have some sort of contest and a giveaway to a walkabout listener. Stay tuned. Stay Details tuned. forthcoming on a future Since episode. Since we just thought of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Europa. Is a moon. Of Jupiter. This is real time <laughs> lyric writing. <apparently. laughs> or just free form sentence. Uh, so, Europa is one of these famous uh, icy moons that's got a liquid ocean under the surface somewhere. It would be really annoying if we did the whole podcast just like alternating <laughs> to finish the that sentences. Would be, yeah. Okay. That, that'd be like an hour long improv skit. <laughs> <laughs> it would. Yikes. Everybody would love that. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be long form. Yes. Okay. Anyway, Europa. So, some years ago... Former AstroCork Tracy Becker. Tracy, Tracy Becker's working on it. NASA's got a mission uh, in the works called the Europa Clipper that is not going to be orbiting Europa. It'll be orbiting Jupiter, but Many focused flybys on, on Europa. Europa like, mm -hmm. 20, like every time it goes around. Kind of like how Cassini went around Jupiter, but often got... Flew by Titan. Flew by Titan. And, and Enceladus. Yeah. Snaps. Yeah. Um, so this will be doing a lot of studies of Europa, and we're interested in it because as a subsurface ocean... And six or so, six or seven years ago, there was an, some observations made by the Hubble Space Telescope. 2013. That s suggested that there was maybe some water vapor mm -hmm. poofing out of yeah. Europa. Not terribly surprising, right? I mean, we see you, when you look at the I'm surface of Europa. I'm terribly surprised, actually. You are? Yes. Oh, maybe, maybe not terribly surprising to somebody who's an idiot and doesn't know much. But you see, <laughs> the surface of Europa, it's, it's got all these... You know, visible scars, cracks and things yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that hints at some kind of, you know, that's in some sense analogous to the plate tectonics on Earth. And there's yeah. cracks there and stuff comes up. And so it's... Right. It's definitely a very young surface, which means it doesn't have very many impact craters. So it's whatever craters are being made all the time. So they've been covered up. So definitely water is coming up to the surface somehow. And as you say, there are these cracks and lineaments that are 
superficially at least similar to the ones at Enceladus, Saturn's mm-hmm. moon, which has these famous right. geysers uh, spewing out water vapor from its south pole. But the reason I was surprised is because the water at Enceladus is quite close to the surface. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe very close, but at most maybe a few kilometers deep, which even so sta- sounds pretty far. But we think but in Europa... Europa it's like a hundred, like fifty in the lowest, fifty kilometers, and sort of the, some of the lowest maybe. estimate. So it's way down there. Yeah, but um, it kind of gets squeezed up somehow. But somehow water does come up. Yeah, and there's some evidence all the way back to Galileo, right, that they detected sort of an increase in the plasma density right around then. You're not um, talking about Galileo Galilei. No, the the probe, the, the probe spacecraft Galileo. Galileo. Okay. Um, it seemed like there was more ionized gas when they flew by sort of the path of Europa. And then HST saw atomic hydrogen and atomic oxygen, which was interpreted to be water that had just been ionized, broken apart by radiation. Uh-huh. So they didn't actually see like water vapor per se, but it was interpreted to be water vapor. Hmm. But now there's new observations from Keck, which is a ground-based telescope. In Hawaii. In Hawaii. Um, they looked over like a long time and, um, many, many nights. So 17 nights from 2016 to 2017, like not consecutive, obviously. Uh Uh, and they looked for water and they actually found what they think was a plume of water vapor on April 26th. So there, yeah. So that was one of the things is that after that initial, after that initial Hubble observation, there were a lot of non-detections. Yeah, there were a lot yeah. of there were a lot of observations that could have seen it if it was the same as that other, mm-hmm. and didn't. And HST has looked a few times. Right. I think even Tracy's been right. Using yeah, they've HST looked. To they've look looked at and not seen it. Mm-hmm. And the and the original detection was you know not in the noise, but it was barely above the noise. Yeah. And so, assuming that's real, it meant that it's not continuous or constant, which is a difference from the Enceladus that geysers because. To... Cassini saw that just all the time, and every measurement we made of it and how much stuff was coming out was consistent with basically no change, and that yeah. it's just like spewing out. And we've been able to see the E-ring right. like and the for E-ring some amount of time, all, and that's produced yes. by that material, so right. it seems like... It's a long-lived and pretty continuous thing going on, and Europa is definitely different that way. But it, I think one of the things about this new one is that it it's at the same... Location? It's maybe not at exactly the same location, but it is pretty localized. Okay. So that like they they saw that a plume came up and it was from one side of the body, or they saw that there was water vapor that they were actually able to detect using Keck, um, and it seemed like it was sort of on one part of the body. Could they localize it to like near one of those big cracks or no? I don't think they have that resolution. No, okay. because yeah, yeah, because the resolution of Europa from ground based stuff right, is going to be right, right, right. They're seeing it come off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you're yeah, when you're at Earth they could maybe, the angular size of Europa in our sky. They is might be able minute. to say like if it's which hemisphere it's on probably, right? right. They'd be able to tell because Europa has some differences in the different areas. It's got like a super crack most of it some of it's super cracked and some's more super cracked. Chaotic or whatever. <laughs> super so. crack. Super crack. That's another yeah, so one of those new sci fi movies. Super it's coming crack? out. Super crack. Oh, or something like It's of about Enceladus in Europa. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So it seems like that this was a pretty big plume and they actually had a really big increase. Um, but it's not, but it's probably, but they didn't see it the other nights, right? So that means, again, that it's not long lived and that it's probably, it's probably a plume. They can't like actually confirm that. Um, but it's hard to have that kind of source if it's not like spewing up from the inside. Because I think you can't get these kinds of ejections with a, like a meteorite impact, right? You know, you wouldn't presumably see something this like much, that. This much stuff. Right. So NASA confirms <laughs> water vapor plumes from Europa. Nice. Yeah. It's not a warning, at least. <laughs> that's that's true. what I don't like is when they issue warnings. That's a warning. Water Saturn's, spewing from Europa. <laughs> right. Saturn's rings, not four and a half billion years old. Run for the hills. <laughs> Um, yeah, I saw, I'm now failing to find it, but I could swear I saw a comparison of two pictures, one from the original and one from the more recent detection that showed it like at the same location. Hmm. Um, but people are characterizing this as going from sort of cautiously optimistic or suggestive to pretty compelling. So that's exciting for the upcoming NASA Europa Clipper mission going there. 
there will be a lot closer yeah. with state-of-the-art instruments. And for and a longer extended period of time, so they'll be able to see if what this variability looks like up close and personal. Excellent. Cool. When is the uh, Europa Clipper getting there? When is it going to yes, do its first science? Definitely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, expected to launch in 2025. Oh, launch in 2025. Yeah. Okay, so this is, this is a really? little ways out. I think so. That's what, this, was, that's what this article says that uh, I'm reading right jeepers. in front of me. I thought it was a long time away, and I didn't even think it was that far away. It's mid-2020s, so those, and a different article, so those two are consistent with each other. Yeah, okay. Hmm. And then it's a few years to get there. I mean, and they're then... still in pretty early instrument development and stuff like that, right? So, yeah, yeah it'd probably take five years to get yeah, there. Yeah, a few years to get there, and then, uh, then of course, a few years to gather science. Yay, science. Science. Speaking of Europa... Jim Cooney. Europa. Oh, exciting. It's a special Top Quark Trivia Tra- Day. Top Quark Trivia Day. Day. Not unique. We, we do it occasionally. I, I, rare. I'll tell you what is rare, though. This is going to be a one-off. It's, it's just one plan. question. It's just one question. It's one what? question. It's, not, it's a, not multi-part. It's not multi-part. I usually love also the multi-part questions. I cannot stop myself once I... Because once you start like investigating something, you see all these cool facts that you didn't know, and you're like, I have to ask about this and this and this. This is just a straight up one-off. Okay. That doesn't sound like anything to me. No? <laughs> <laughs> Does not comprehend. I don't know what you mean. Um, all right. So I was thinking about that ocean on Europa. As one does. As one does. Uh, and then I was thinking about pressure. So this is actually a question oh, about pressure. Under pressure. So your question is very is simple. That right? Uh, Astro Corks and listeners, your question is very simple. Which one of the following has the highest pressure? Oh. Ooh, fun. Right? Is my job on the list? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or which, which one of these locations and or phenomena occur at the highest pressure? So okay. Okay. A, the ocean floor of Europa. Ocean floor, ocean floor of, of Europa. Okay. okay. What is the pressure of the what's ocean? What? The pressure of the water okay. at the okay. uh, floor of the ocean at Europa. Okay. B, the bottom of the Mariana Trench, okay. which is the deepest okay. point in the Earth's oceans. That's uh-huh. actually called. Um, there's the specific spot. Right. So something oh, deep. Really? Uh, the something Challenger deep. deep Challenger or something. Challenger yeah. Deep. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So yes. the pressure at Challenger Deep. Also a movie coming out soon. Is it? Uh, Challenger so that's B. C, the bottom of the solar photosphere. Oh. D, the surface of Venus. Okay. Or I, E. That's the only one that I actually know what I know. the number is. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. And again, I, I know that <laughs> you, okay, you guys will be able to orient some of these very easily, but okay. not necessarily everyone. So, And E, the hydrogen critical pressure. What's so that? That is the pressure at which... Hydrogen is no longer independently a liquid or a gas. It's metallic both. hydrogen. No, not metallic. It's not the, not the pressure at which it becomes liquid metallic. Liquid and a gas. At this is this point. is a chemistry thing, right? The critical point is. I don't do chemistry. You, lost us. you should. <laughs> right at, at at high enough temperatures you and pressures, should. things like or anything uh, loses dis, this, the the the, <laughs> the distinction between a yeah. gas and a liquid. Okay. This is like what happens to Jupiter. You go down in Jupiter, it's like, okay. it's hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Holy crap, all well, of a sudden I'm in liquid hydrogen. Where did that, when did that happen? It didn't happen at any specific point. It just could slowly you tell happened. Me what pressure we're talking about there? <laughs> <laughs> nice it's try. The pressure at which that happens. Nice try. Okay. All right, cool. We'll come back to the that. The answer is all of them are less pressure than our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> it's the end of the semester. Yay! Not the podcast, of course. I'm not referring to the podcast, of course. Oh, yeah, that's the fun part of that's our job. Yeah, that's the best part. It's the pressure alleviating aspect. Right. The pause. Okay. So we'll come back to that. Um, lunar swirls. Woo! The moon. Yes. The moon. I'm talking about moons. Our moon? Uh-huh. Our moon. So, and there's no real, this is sort of just a little update, right? There's yes. not any sort of new um, evidence about lunar swirls. So lunar swirls are these enigmatic features. They're weird. They're so I crazy. like them because they remind me of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Okay. This is exciting me because I have no idea what you guys are talking about. <gasps> really? 
I've never heard of a lunar swirl. What? That's why this is. I, that's why we have you on the show exciting. so you can learn about new things. I, I'm very yes. excited to learn. Go ahead. So lunar swirls are these enigmatic features on the surface of the moon um, that um, sometimes you can see them in just visible light. So they have some albedo differences. So like they're a little bit. There's like some white patches and some dark patches. They look kind of like, swirly. They are kind of swirly. So sometimes they look kind of like this. Sometimes they look. <laughs> Addie's pointing <laughs> at her computer. Yeah, I was showing Jim. Useful. For, <laughs> we'll I'm post learning. A Our listeners may not be learning we'll anything, but I am. You and can, a lot of times, you can watch it on YouTube and see Addie pointing at her computer. Yes, screen. exactly. <laughs> but you will see. So there's so they're and they're only in specific spots on the surface on the surface of the moon, and they're usually they're in. Kind of, they're not huge, right? They're, they're but they're, they're kilometers in scale, yeah, sort of. So yes. miles. Yes. Not like tiny little things, but not as big as this man on the moon features. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Um, and so they, and they're in, yeah, so they're in specific regions. Um, and there's lots of hypotheses. We don't really know still how they're formed. There's, there's something lots of magnetic, hypotheses. right? Or do we not even know that they're for sure? They're typically associated with magnetic anomalies. So and that's why I think about 2001. Okay. Because the monolith is a magnetic anomaly. It's Tycho Magnetic Anomaly 1. Mm. And they go digging, and then they find the monolith. Oh, so this is all good stuff. So that, but there's probably not monoliths so, underneath. But I think there might be. There might be. I, I'm with Josh one on this one. Yeah, okay. there's, okay. There's, there's almost certainly monoliths. I think I, there's, there's I that's think a monoliths near certainty. On the moon. There are monoliths <laughs> underneath <laughs> those <laughs> things. Uh, we have to, we'll have to go to Jupiter or Saturn <laughs> to find out, depending on whether or not we can afford the special effects to go to Saturn. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> is there so much stress? Yes. Um, uh, so th- yeah. Anyway, um, so there there often are magnetic anomalies associated with them, but I think there are a few that don't have them. Um, and so one big hypothesis for how they form is actually due to electrostatic effects. What? Um, so there's an idea, but because they're be powerful enough to make visible surface, because there's these magnetic anomalies, they create sort of um, interesting like the little magnetic fields above the surface, right? And charged particles from the sun, um, protons, hydrogen, things like that are streaming in and they impact the surface and do what we call space weathering, which is where um, it hits the surface and it can actually, because it's energetic, it can modify the surface. Does and some so chemistry, think, Does some chemistry. Chemistry, yeah. nice. Yes. Does chemistry on the surface. Love it's chemistry. True. So we think that it could be that the, the solar wind is interacting with these magnetic fields and then that makes it uh, impact at certain places on the surface and so scours some regions more, but then say it like protects some regions from getting right. impacted by these so solar they get high energy different particles. Ways Swirly pattern. Yep, and, mm-hmm. and we fields are swirly. Often create swir- swirly patterns, um, and so that sort of makes sense. So that's one of the sort of leading hypotheses these days. Cool. Um, hmm. I like. Th- I I didn't know about them until relatively recently, like in the last ten years. Yeah, and, they've gotten uh, a lot of interest in the last ten ish years. Right, because of, there's monoliths. Because there, there might be like monoliths there underneath. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah, and they. Um, yeah, they're, they're sometimes a few of them are associated with like big impact features, except that they're on the antipode of the big impact feature. Nice word. Uh, which means the other side of the moon from the big impact feature. Why didn't you just say that then? I did just now. Okay. That's an excellent Scrabble Cause, term. Because antipode, antipode is fun to say. Yeah. Very nice. Anyway, okay. so so cool. it was a long time. It was thought that maybe they were due to like impacts and things that happened back during the impact time and you get stuff sort of aggregating on the other side. And, but now we think it's probably magnetic fields. And people have been proposing various sorts of mission ideas to go yeah. examine these things in more detail because we now haven't actually like sent a lander or anything no. like that to and the magnetic, one of these lunar swirl locations. Yeah, and the magnetic field measurements are all from much higher up orbitally and it's really hard to detect details of magnetic right. fields when you're that high up. So Maybe there's a lot of close. little like CubeSat mission ideas where you'd sort of zoom a few CubeSats through the um, magnetic fields and actually measure them better yeah. and it'd be fun. Cool um, but so there's this new uh, article, I guess we were reading about that was um, so because these these mag- these are localized magnetic fields, they might actually protect the surface a little bit from these charged particles. They ah. could be interesting places to set up habitats. I want to move there. There you go. I'll You'll have, have a, I'll have my monolith, and I'll be safe Protected from the solar from the wind. Solar wind. Mm-hmm. Nice. It's great. great. So that's Good where deal. Josh is going to live soon. Right. Dig a hole next to a monolith. <laughs> oh, if we could find a pit in. A oh, one of those lava pit things. Yeah, a lava tube pit those in a swirl. So it would be cool. so safe. Those are super cool and crazy looking. There's a new order. There's, there's these these lava tubes under the moon. Yeah, and then occasionally the ground above them 
craves in, and so you just have this like circular hole that just goes to this giant cavernous space. First time I saw, we'll have to post pictures of that. Yeah. First time I saw pictures, though, I was like, that's so fake. Yeah, right? It, it looks, because the first ones they found and released were like super, they're very stark. And yes. it's very interesting. Yeah. But so, and they've done, they've they, done a like lot of imaging. Cookie of, cutters into the moon that's yeah. just like, oh, the moon is hollow. And we see these <laughs> on Earth. So in lava tubes Star on Earth, Trek you see fail pits. For the world is hollow and I have touched the sky. Sweet. Okay. So pits are another place you could live because you can be down underneath are and there then you have a, the regular Do we know if there's a pit next to any lunar swirls or not for sure? I don't think we found sure. any. Okay. Yeah. That's totally where we want to go, though. Mm -hmm. But if there's monoliths underneath, then it'd be hard to have a pit. Yes. So. Okay. Solved. Jim. So, so I'm a little bit jealous because uh, uh, Addie just got to talk about swirly stuff, and which sounds good. I got to have to chunk about chunky, chunky stuff, stuff. <laughs> which is not nearly as, as, as attractive. <laughs> well, some people prefer chunky. I swirly. like chunky peanut butter. I loathe Sometimes chunky you... peanut butter. But you know what I do like? Chunky swirly space time. You would. Chunky <laughs> space time. <laughs> no, I would. If you, I, if you put a, uh, a, you know, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich... I'll eat, I'll eat the hell out of that. I love peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You put chunky peanut butter on there, I will throw it up. Really? <laughs> and that throw up will be chunky. Why would you okay. Why I would will, you have I eaten will, it in the first I place? I will die in either case. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, that's true. Yeah. Killed, killed Josh. <laughs> Poor Josh. We'll put it in front of Jim, not Josh. <laughs> All right. Uh, so anyway, this is, a, this is a just a fun what bit about... What about swirly peanut butter? <laughs> that would be delicious. Okay. So that's why you're very lucky. Okay. Um, so this is uh, uh, thinking about the nature of the universe itself. And we've talked lots about space time and stuff like that when we talk about general relativity. Uh, a big question we have Big in physics GRT. is space time. Can we get that on shirts? <laughs> <laughs> uh, space time, fundamentally, yep. um, in the general theory of relativity, it is a continuous thing. So that is, uh, it is, you know, you could divide space up into little bits and little bits and little smaller bits, and it doesn't mean you can keep dividing it up forever, and it's still just... And that that that's basically just sort of saying the nature of the equations has variables that can have any value. That can have any just value. like I can pick any number. I can say X is a number between minus infinity and infinity, and I can say it's 1.3 or 1.3001, and I can put as many zeros there that's before right. the one or whatever. That's right. That's so that's right. all that means when you say that general relativity is continuous. That's right. Is that there's nothing in the theory that says, oh, no, I got to right. jump from this number to the next number. That's right. And that's, that's very that's very much like like Newtonian mechanics used to right. be. Like, like you can have a planet at any distance from the sun, right? And right. it doesn't... But quantum physics works very differently than that, right? So quantum physics... like It is such a troublemaker. It is a troublemaker. Is. So if you're thinking about, uh, you know, the electron around a proton in a hydrogen atom, the electron is not allowed to just be wherever it wants or not allowed to have whatever energy it wants. It has to have... Only this or that or the other energy that we call that discretized, right? It's, it's, it's discrete energy levels. And that's a, a thing that is radically different in quantum physics than in regular yeah. old classical physics. And I have to say that as much as quantum stuff is a troublemaker, I love that about quantum. Yeah. That it's discretized. Yeah. It's, it's the, the discrete energy level yeah, it's, it's, is an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. And... and, and I always like teaching that, but I think my students aren't as excited about it as I, I am. Exa it's exactly the same way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I get super excited about it. I'm you like, have like a stool you can the, jump up on. Yeah. And I'm like, this is ladder. the coolest thing. I'm like <laughs> run up the stairs yeah. if the classroom has stairs. Like I can be here and I can be here, but I, I can't, can't be, be in there. between. Right. And each one corresponds to a different color of light. Yeah. And that's how we know all these things and look through your diffraction gratings. Yeah. And the students are like... What do we have to know about they're this They're just like again? scrolling. Yeah. I was is doing fraction the gradients the other day, and they're just like scrolling through their phones. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I because said, it, yeah. the thing is, it's hard to appreciate how weird it is until you really appreciate the, the earlier stuff, like appreciate what Newtonian physics is all about. And, th and then you see how weird it is that the electrons can only have this energy level or that. Like, mm -hmm. to the students, I just say that, and they're like, okay, okay. I accept okay, sure. that as a fact. And But like... That's really weird. And the, the physicists back in the you know teens and twenties had a really hard back time when I was getting my start. <laughs> yeah, uh, accepting that because it just is is totally unnatural. But at least that was after the era of recombination. Josh. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> um, so the question has been in recent years in physics. Uh, that's true of things like electrons and photons and the electromagnetic field. These things are discretized. discretized. The it's question discretized. is. Yeah. I was wondering if you were going to have a debate we're gonna, about we're, how, we are. how to say this. <laughs> we're we're going to get into a, a I always used to say discretized. Discretized. Really? Yeah. yeah. 
That, that's how it's said. That like, like I say discreet, but it's discretized. Discretized. Yeah. Discretized. Yep. Yeah. Um, I don't know which one's actually So the correct. question is, is space and are space and time themselves discretized? That Chunky? is chunky that is are they chunky right so that is if you went to a small if you had a big enough magnifying glass and could see space on the tiniest 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 possible scales could you actually still be at any point or would you have to be at this one or that one or that one that you can only how tiny so it's just like it's going to be very very tiny like quantum tiny so it's like when you're got your powerpoint document open and you're drawing something and you have grid set snap to grid (laughs) right is you know so that you can't actually move your thing wherever you want to. It's always going to go from point one inch over to the next point one inch. Right. So that oh. may be, and we've that been may be the way space. We've is. been guessing that that may be the way space because oh god, is space everything like else PowerPoint is, is everything else is, uh, is is fundamentally ruled by quantum physics. Why yeah. not space time also be fundamentally ruled by that? Yeah. Uh, but this is a really hard thing to test because if it is. Discretized. It's discretized on a tiny, 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 tiny scale. Is it By the, the way, this is maybe scale? even weirder if you're talking about... Yes. It is the Planck uh, scale. This is maybe weirder if you're thinking about time. Like, it could be that you can exist at this time, and then the next time, and then the next time, only at oh. discrete times, but you don't go through the times in between. Wait, yes. I'm not living That's continuously? Correct. You might not yeah. be. You so might not be. That ties into a whole branch of philosophy and theology uh, called process... Uh, philosophy, what, really? Alfred North Whitehead, uh, which says philosophy. that there are sort of these discretized uh, realizations of happiness and things Weird. like that. That's so what my dad's dissertation was on. Oh, Alfred really? Oh, wow. yeah. We'll have to check that out. Yeah. Um, it's super complicated. But for a long time, this has just been like... It doesn't have any equations. So. <laughs> <laughs> for a long time, this has been just Word like uh, uh, speculation, right? So uh, and it still will all be. of our best kind of... Th- we want to mix general relativity and quantum physics, so we're trying to figure out if this is true. Uh, but recently, some people have suggested some possible ways to actually test whether this is true or not. Ooh. Are they missions? Uh, without a big giant um, magnifying glass. Oh. It's by looking <laughs> at the speed of light and looking at the speed of light really carefully. So oh. the speed of light is a constant. Sure. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But is it really? So that is, oh. if you look at light that has a short enough wavelength, it might be that that light has a little bit harder time getting through discretized space than longer wavelength wa- light would be. Oh, because if, if the wavelength of the light oh. is anywhere reasonably comparable to – it doesn't even have to be comparable, but is is small enough, it's 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 kind of like, you know, if you're going over a rough road, if okay. – uh, If you're small, like, you hit a big bump. If you're small, right. If you're small, then you see these big bumps and you, basically you have you travel along the road and you're going to end up going slower because you keep – Sort coming up against ratcheting into right. it like a gear or right. something like that. Whereas uh, big long wavelengths don't see Josh. don't but see the, this. But the Planck scale, the scale that you're talking about, this discretization of space time, right? But, it, but is a very is it, it is say, much smaller. It is a very very tiny. Scale. It is a very tiny number. So it's possible but, that this discretization doesn't happen on that scale. That's like the minimum possible scale. But it could be at larger scales than that. And so all we're going to be able to do with these measurements is put some. If we if we don't see this change in the speed of light for but this very high frequency we, light, so then we're all we're going to do is put a, a so bound. So like gamma on. rays. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so oh, that's what oh. this 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 idea is oh, is high, actually a frequency. an astronomical thing that we're <gasps> going to send out satellites, a whole bunch of little cubesats, yay, to look for gamma ray bursts because we have to have a huge amount of data of with course. the very highest <laughs> frequency light that we know of, which is gamma rays. So we need much more. Gamma ray astronomy happening, uh, and if we do that with a large amount of data, we might be able to tease out very tiny f- little differences in the speed of light of gamma rays compared to visible, visible light or radio there, or something like that. Is there an active gamma ray telescope right now? Um, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think the Chandra still, X-ray Chandra Observatory still, is still active, still active. Um, and famous. there are a couple of other ones I think as well. And somewhat peripherally related to that, I forgot to mention this during Space News, but we talked about in a previous episode the Alpha Magnetic oh, yeah, Spectrometer. AMS. There was on another ISS. spacewalk. There was a second spacewalk going on today. Today, with that repairs that we talked about. Apparently, last time. Friday is spacewalk day up on the station. <laughs> yeah, right. So anyway, this is this is just a, a, a possible proposal right. that we're thinking well, about. So a, keep your ears open. We should have a betting pool. It has a we good name. Have a pool. It's called Grail Quest, the Gamma Ray Astronomy International Laboratory for Quantum Exploration of Space Time. Right, and th- but it's not a real uh, a, mission a, yet. This is just, no, no, it's a proposed mission. It's a proposed. Yeah. Mission. there's a, a lot of reasonable acronym. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of um, proposals and things for planetary missions and for astronomy missions. I think that are going to be coming out in the next. 
six months kind of thing because right. there's the planetary decadal survey right. is um, coming up soon, and there's I think There'll an be, Astro is doing a right. review, and NASA will be announcing selection of the next discovery missions. Oh I believe, yeah, uh, somewhat soon. Those proposals yeah. were submitted this summer of uh, 2019, so we should be hearing. Ooh, about keep those. your ears open. We'll see yeah. some good things. Sometimes Grail soon. Quest. All right, cool. All right. So let's see what your answers are. Which one of the following? Oh, yeah. Places or right. phenomena okay, happen so at yeah, the highest pressure. Venus. The ocean floor of Europa. The ocean floor of Earth at right. the deepest point. Challenger deep. Uh, the bottom of the solar photosphere. The solar, photos- solar photosphere being the visible surface layer of yes. the sun's atmosphere. The surface of Venus uh-huh. or the hydrogen critical pressure. I know what I'm going to guess. Do it. Go for it. Hydrogen critical pressure. Okay. I am going to guess... Venus. Venus. I don't so, think that's right, though. I'm pretty sure that Challenger Deep is greater pressure than the, the Venus. surface of I Venus. I kind of think that's probably true. Yes, you're but both I, you're both wrong. Okay. The one number that you guys know is probably the pressure at the surface of Venus, which right. is roughly... Nine, nine bars. Right, 90 yeah. times Earth's atmospheric pressure, 90 yeah. atmospheres or so. Challenger Deep is th- probably more, right? It is more. Uh, Challenger Deep is very high pressure. It's about 1,000 times Earth's atmospheric pressure, 1,000 atmospheres. Is Venus the lowest? No, it is not the lowest. The bottom of the solar photosphere. I thought I would trick you guys with that one. Nah. Because, but uh, It's low no, density up there. It is. It's only 0.1 atmosphere at the I, bottom yeah, of the solar I, photosphere. I, I, yeah. You didn't trick us. Nice try. I tried. I okay. thought, I thought about, you'd think the sun. It's Europa? big and heavy. Yeah. Uh, I've already done. I think I did. In, in intro astronomy, sometimes you the actual like, how much would you weigh if you could walk on the sun? And it's uh. like, not that much. Right, but this is the bottom of the photosphere. But again, bottom it's of the <laughs> photosphere. It's still right. pretty high. That's, that's, the, that's where still you do that calculation for. Fair that's enough. Jeez, Jim. Gosh. Fine. Well, you, then I didn't get you there. Uh, the hydrogen critical pressure is actually lower than I would have thought. It's only 12.8 atmospheres. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. So it is your, is it Europa? Is Europa it's the Europa. answer? The answer was the uh, could, ocean floor of Europa, which is something remember. like, and again, we don't know exactly because we this don't know exactly how deep it is, but the, the, the best guesstimates are around 2,000 atmospheres. Really? Yeah. Because it's a much it's very thicker deep column. It's very deep water, and there's a huge amount of ice on top of it. Right. Yeah. Even though the, the gravity, of course, of Europa is it's much, much less, less than Earth, the depth of yeah. the ocean and the, the thickness of the ice. How, what's the thickness of the ocean on but to Challenger Deep, how far down is it's Challenger seven Deep? Seven miles. Seven miles. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's far down there, but not very far. but not nearly That's as not deep as right. the ocean in on Europa. You like haven't even started the ocean on Europa. But interestingly, by the way, that that the technology that we currently have is good enough to protect instruments if you went down to the bottom of the ocean in Europa. So I was reading something about you really? know d- designing, you know, these <laughs> deep water. <laughs> we can't, are, but we can't. Oh, people so, are making these. Mm, spherical, transparent, uh, terrestrial submarines Ooh. I was just reading about that are that can take three, and they're working on like six or seven person things that are like seven inch thick um, glass or plastic spheres uh, that can go down like, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but on the order of a kilometer. I saw those so. in Jurassic World. Yeah, something they look just like that, <laughs> right? And they that would be really people. awesome. Would you rather? Yeah, it's terrifying. Be in one of those underneath the ocean, like down at super low, like super low, yes, high depths space. in the ocean, or in a like a Bigelow inflatable habitat in space. Uh, Does this mean which one are you more scared of? Uh, which one which would one you rather, rather do? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it's the know. opposite of which one. You're I want to do both. Of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I find the ocean terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're in a big sphere and you can see all around you, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Imagine all those cool deep water fish and stuff yeah. that you can see. Oh yeah, Jim uh, wants the ocean one. I, I do like the ocean one, though. Space is awesome too. Yeah. Well, it may have felt like waiting for the universe to become transparent after the Big Bang. <laughs> it was just another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. If you liked this episode of Walk About the Galaxy, write us a review and scream it while being interviewed as a pundit on a cable news show. <laughs> Be sure to like us on Facebook to get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com where you can also order our Walk About the Galaxy t-shirts. Woo-hoo! Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can see that Josh is actually a Westworld automaton. Oh, Catch so up on sense. old episodes wherever yes. you get your podcast. Thanks to our listeners in Huntsville, Alabama, and around the world. Follow us on Twitter. At walk underscore the underscore galaxy. And ask us questions anywhere using hashtag walk about the galaxy. Our theme music was composed by Richard Jerusik, our production assistant and video guru is Diego Rodriguez. I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Addie Dove. I'm Jim Cooney. We're the Astro Cork signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Oh, <laughs> I'm supposed to say something. You're supposed